كالطير أغناها وقد جابت سماء كم مرة عصف الأنين بداخلي كم مرة قد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته How's everyone doing? It's brother Haji So the video is finally here My response to Da'wa man is now uh, a reality uh, I just want to sort of put a uh, brief introduction um, I want to present clearly that there was a valid difference of opinion uh, amongst the early Salaf in relation to this particular topic Now, I'm not sort of denying that later uh, stated that the Ijma'a but what I'm trying to sort of clear the fact that obviously the early Salaf didn't understand it that way okay and the Salaf uh, as per many many testimony many many statements of their actions clearly indicate that uh, Khuruj is not uh, an issue as such where it was mutlaq and haram it was mutlaq and haram and the best generations didn't understand it that way secondly these uh, particular uh, groups or institutionalized waste papers you know give them uh, legitimize or legitimize religious oppression and at the end of the day we have many honorable ulama that will always refute this uh, filthy manhaj and at the end of the day that's what it is and lastly um, I've put up regular images and photos in connection to this particular video or leading up to this particular video and I've noticed a particular individual you know, having a little bit of a, a nosy look. Check out if you recognize this guy. Okay? Strange, eh? What's he doing on my page? So anyway, enjoy the video. Make dua for us. Anything I bring which is corrected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and anything I say wrong uh, and, and incorrect, it is from myself and shaitan. Make dua for me. Subscribe, bro. Hajji. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. How are you doing, everyone? It's Brother Hajji. As you all know, there's been quite a back and forth between myself, Shamsi and Da'waman. Now as you know, we have two people coming out doing what they usually do is making tabdi'a. Making tabdi'a. Now calling someone a khariji is wasf bid'a, which is tabdi'a. And this requires a mujtahid. Okay? To call someone a khariji, okay, which is tabdi'a. This requires a mujtahid. Now, da'wah man, I'm going to ask you a question. What are your qualifications? What are your qualifications? What are your qualifications? And again, what are your qualifications, my brother? Where have you studied? What is your level of knowledge? This is a question I'm going to stick on because these people are known for this rhetoric. Okay, hurling accusations, slanderous remarks, etc. You're known for this, you're known for this. They always ask us, who are your men? Now they are coming with these rulings. We have a right to ask, who are your men? And where have they got their deen from? Okay, because we're not making tabdi on anyone. You're accusing us of being, har of being kharijis and... I'd like to ask you a question, my brother. Can you really speak and read Arabic? As it's reached me via one of your friends that you get sentences translated for you and you practice reading sentence dozens of times, okay? You read <laughs> dozens of times before shooting. Is this true? I'm only asking, okay? I'm only asking. Again, this has come from one of your friends, okay? So I just wanted to clarify. Touching on that, okay, and also in relation to myself, I am just a layman. Okay, I'm just a layman. I put my hand up. I am, a, I am a simple layman. But I'm not making tabdi on anyone. I'm not taking the right of any Muslims. Okay, so just bear that in mind. It's the other side that are slandering and accusing and insulting. It's not come from myself. Yes, I mock. I could put my hand up to that. But I don't slander and I don't take the right of anyone. Now let's start off slowly. Okay, we're going to get into the main part of the video later on. But we're just going to start off slowly and work our way up. Now I'm going to play a video for you and Dawaman mentions that this issue of khuruj is from the aspects of Aqidah. Okay? So let's listen to him and we'll come back. This is the issue of creed. Now as you heard, Dawaman says this is an issue of Aqidah. That's not the case as it's Aqidah and Fiqh at the same time. Okay? It's Aqidah and Fiqh at the same time. And many of the Fuqaha Okay, many of the fuqaha have stated this is from the Masail Furu'iyya. This is from the subsidiary matters, not just in 
Aqidah. Now, Ibn Wazir, okay, Ibn Wazir, in his book, Al Awasim Wal Qawasim, mentions, okay, and you can see the screenshot, it's uh, circled in green. He mentions, he mentions that the speech in relation to rebelling against the tyrant ruler, according to them, is from the speculative rulings. Speculative, dhanni, not qat'i, dhanni, okay, for Ibn Wazir. And he also states, the one that rebels against the tyrant, mustahillan li dhalik, he makes it permissible in that. And it's no sin, okay, there's no sin. Why is that? لِأَنَّهُ عَمِلَ بِإِجْتِهَادِهِ فِي مَسْأَلَةِ ذَنِّيَّةٍ فُرُعِيَّةٍ That this is from the actions of ijtihad. The one that rebels against a tyrant ruler is from the angle or from the actions of ijtihad, which is the rulings which are speculative and are subsidiary. Okay, which are secondary, subsidiary and speculative. You can't just force your opinion down people's throats. Okay, I'm not denying that it's the, the, the Imams haven't put this in, this in their books of Aqidah. But also, many of the Fuqaha put it in their books of Fiqh. So it's Aqidah and Fiqh at the same time. Ibn Wazir, in his Rawdu, he mentions, أَنَّ كَلَامْ فِي الْخُرُوجِ عَلَىٰ أَئِمَّةِ الْجَوْرِ عِنْدُهُمْ مِنَ الْمَسَائِلِ الْذَنِّيَّةِ الْفُرُعِيَّةِ That according to Ibn Wazir, that the speech of rebelling, or yeah, rebelling against a transgressive ruler, according to them, is from the speculative subsidiary rulings. التي لا يأثم المخالف فيها and that no the opponent is not sinful in that ولشافعية في جواز ذلك وجهان معروفان with regards to the شافعية meaning its permissibility have two well known opinions okay so in relation to the شافعية its permissibility have two well known opinions ذكرهما في الروضة للنووي and both of them are mentioned in the روضة of نووي وفي مجمع المدحب في قواعد المدحب and it's mentioned in that book للشيخ الصالع الدين العلاء وذكر ذلك غير واحد that is mentioned in more than one person ومن معلوم أن ذلك لو كان حراما قطعا كشوري بالخمر and if it is well known that if it was حرام absolutely like drinking alcohol لم يكن لهم فيه قولان and if it was impermissible meaning khuruj like it is qat'an meaning absolutely like it is like drinking alcohol then there wouldn't be two opinions in this matter how you try to propagate and how you try to force an opinion and force a ruling like it's the only one no it's not entirely the case and we're going to go when the video carries on you'll see many of the fuqaha have put this in their books of fiqh also you mentioned that all aqidah issues are being matters of ijma that's not the case my friend that's not the case you know behave yourself mate and also, what you did as well, you oversimplified the usuli understanding. Okay? You oversimplified that. Now, Tufi and his sharh of 40 hadith Nawawi mentions over 16 types. 16 types. Other ulama mentioned over 36 types of dalil. How you simplified it, you know, is beyond me. For example, for mention of the adilla, three ayat, ten or so a hadith, and then the af'al of the sahaba. Okay? He also mentions four imams with different views. Adilla. How you oversimplified it, my friend. I don't know how you done that. Interestingly enough, he mentions the story of Ahmed bin Nasr al Khuzai, who made khuruj against Al Wathiq Billah. And Imam Ahmed praised him after he was killed. Okay? So, funny enough, you mentioned Imam Ahmed bin Nasr al Khuzai, but you forgot to mention to your audience he did khuruj. Okay? Just a side note. Okay. Moving on swiftly. Just by the way, I admit, okay, here and now, that my Arabic isn't the best. And I've always said, constantly, your simple brother from Birmingham. Okay, I am layman as they come. Okay? And I'm still learning, by the way. I'm still learning and trying to improve. So picking faults and holes in my Arabic isn't a major achievement, my friend. You haven't done something spectacular. If anything, I laugh at it myself. So, you know, it's a... Uh, it's something that you think you you find out and you know you've you've found something interesting that no one else has believe me everyone else has as well but now that you're picking faults let's return the favor okay because i'm not the one professing to be an expert by the way so let's see how embarrassing it is for you now when your faults are picked out who was the man who was the father of the khawarij something that's not disputed and even you will agree was a man called Vu <laughs> so if you didn't notice he said Vu 
ذو خويصرا but my friend is ذو خويصرا you need to work on your idafa my friend you need to work on your idafa okay so ذو خويصرا also we'll play another video for you okay it's only fair isn't it it's only fair come on my friend listen to this so anyway what did ibn khuldun okay so my friend you said ibn khuldun well in fact it's ibn khaldun it's a fatha all right my friend so again you need to polish up and you said that a number of times as well by the way in about 30 seconds you said ibn khuldun about two or three times so just so that you know we're helping each other my friend and this is the funniest one there's many more by the way but i'm not petty like you i'm just gonna pick two or three because the video will speak volumes as to your deceit and your slander and your lack of sincerity let's listen to this hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu number one just to mention as a side point in case you know because the sahaba are the first generation of the salaf right so he was alone the rest of the sahaba he opposed them on this he opposed umar ibn khattab radiallahu anhu ibn mas'ud radiallahu anhu abu mas'ud al-badri hudayfa okay <laughs> this is the funniest of them all he said that hussein opposed umar ibn khattab radiallahu anhu when he was mentioned about the sahaba radiallahu anhum that told him not to go and i have to break it to you my friend umar ibn, umar ibn khattab radiallahu anhu died about 35 years before so unless he came back from the dead then i don't know who taught you that Umar bin Khattab was the one that was opposing Hussein? Or oh, Hussein obviously did not listen to Umar bin Khattab. So anyway, a lesson for you, my friend. Get that chip off your shoulder. We all make mistakes. It happens to the best of us. So it's just, you know, you, you keep feeling a bit embarrassed now, don't you? Okay? Feeling a bit embarrassed. It's okay, mate. It's all right. Okay. Now, let's play another video for you. This is one of the most shocking things I've ever heard. Wallah al And I'm going to expose you. Listen to this. He brought to our attention something powerful here. He said, this is proof that you can become a khariji based on just your tongue. Forget actually rebelling against the ruler with the sword, which is what you're talking about throughout the video. Just merely just moving your tongue against the ruler, the unjust ruler, is... Is, is something enough to render you as a khariji. Yeah. Now, as you just heard, Da'wah man mentioned that to speak against the ruler by just your tongue, okay, will render you as a khariji. And he quoted Ibn Uthaymeen, uh, Ibn Uthaymeen regarding this particular issue. Now, that's, that is false. If, he, if you go back and read Shara al aqidah Wasatiyah, he didn't say that at all. But that's near here nor there. But go check that. That is that is, you misquoting uh, Ibn Uthaymin. And all the Umara and Hukam on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the statement of Dhul Khuwaisara. It is absolutely shocking. One is a Prophet who is inspired by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Okay? One is a Prophet that's inspired by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Whilst the others are just standard people. So just because Dhul Khuwaisara said to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'dil, be just, based on that, you're saying that anyone that criticizes the ruler is on the same darajat? Just to add on top of that, let me add another point. If someone mocked any human being, for example, just anyone, it doesn't render you a kafir, does it? But if anyone mocks the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you become a kafir automatically. If anyone mocks the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is a kafir. We agree upon this. But why, if someone mocks the ruler, do they now become a kafir? Now, this is where it's going to get really, really detrimental for you. You said that anyone that criticizes the oppressive ruler with just their tongue becomes a khariji. Stick on your principle, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to drown you in your own principle. As you can see, this is Kitab al-Sunnah by Imam Kirmani. Imam Kirmani is the direct student of Imam Ahmed and he's from the Salaf. Okay? And he narrates, and as you can see the, uh, the screenshot with it being yellow, uh, underlined in yellow, it mentions that Abi Ja'farin, which is Imam Bakr alayhi salam, mentions that Hassan and Hussein used to curse Marwan. Marwan ibn Hakam. Now we agree Marwan ibn Hakam was oppressive. It was very, very oppressive. 
The leaders of the youth in heaven, Sayyida Shabab al Jannah, used to curse Marwan. Now, who was Marwan ibn Hakam? Who was Marwan ibn Hakam? Marwan ibn Hakam was a ruler. Marwan ibn Hakam was a ruler. Hassan al Hussein al Khawarij? I know you're quite petty. You waste paper of the rulers are quite petty. They are using technicalities, using little you know, slanders here and there, which things I haven't said. I'm going to address that as well. Don't worry about it. So you would probably say, oh, yeah, yeah, but they probably did curse Marwan, but they didn't do it in front of his face. Dhul uh, Khawaisara uh, did it in front of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's face. Now, there's another narration for you, okay, just in case you use that argument, but you know what? Dhul Khawaisara did it in front of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, let's give you something special, okay? As you can see, this book is Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba. Okay, Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba. And as you can see from the screenshot, Abi Ja'farin, okay, Abi Ja'farin was asked, regarding prayer behind the leaders, okay? So, Abi Ja'farin, which is Imam Bakr alayhi salam, faqala, he said, Salli ma'ahum fa inna nusalli ma'ahum Pray with them, for indeed we prayed with them. They said that Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anhumah used to pray behind Marwan, okay? He used to pray behind Marwan. And Marwan is the leader, by the way. He is the leader. And he was the uh, oppressive ruler as well. If you read about his biography, he was very oppressive. So he said, the one who was asking Imam Bakr السلام, the question, he said the people allege that they did this out of taqiyya, that they prayed behind Marwan out of taqiyya. So Imam Ja'far السلام, oh sorry, Imam Bakr السلام, said this, listen, what kaifa? How is that? How is that? That Hassan used to curse Marwan in front of his face and he used to be on the member giving the Jum'ah khutbah. So Hassan radiallahu anhu used to curse Marwan in front of his face and he was on the member. So let me ask you a question, my friend. You have called the youth or the leaders of the youth in paradise as khawarij. So, just to simplify for my brothers and sisters, in one narration, cursed Marwan, who was an oppressive ruler, Hassan radiallahu anhu, cursed Marwan in front of his face while he was on the mimbar, and prayed behind Marwan as well. So, according to Da'wah man, the grandsons of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are khawarij. Now, you can't come out with technicalities and ijtihad. You said, this is evidence that someone with a tongue. Okay? From the tongue. Okay? So don't back off now, my friend. Don't be going behind or, or trying to use another technical. No, but is who said that there's an exception for the Sahaba? Who said that? You, it's your analogy. It's your ridiculous analogy. It don't make any sense, mate. So as you apply it here, apply it there now as well. Okay? Now, you keep reiterating that we Ahle Sunnah will go to the corners of the earth refuting your bid'ah. Okay? That's what you said, didn't you? Now, what message are you trying to send? You're, you're ruining everything I'm, I'm working for, my brother. I'm educating the Shia, and you're blowing everything, my friend, by calling them khawarij. What are you doing? It was better that you just make your videos regarding three sums and my auntie had sex with X, Y, and Z, and shout mad thing in the masjid. Just stay there, mate. Stick in your lane. And we know everything that you're bringing isn't from you, mate. You're not that smart, my brother. Okay? You're not that smart. Okay. Now, let's get to another video now. I'm going to play a video for you now. Listen to this. And that's a side point. But now, to show you, Hussein radiallahu anhu, that he's not even khuruj the way you're painting it out. Ibn Khuldun, he mentions in his tarikh, that, say about Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, he never even gave bay'ah to Yazid in the first place. Okay, hold up. He never gave him bay'ah. That's the first point. So he never gave him bay'ah as his imam in the first place. Now as you heard, that woman mentioned that Hussein did not do khuruj because he didn't give bay'ah. Okay, and that was his argument. He was saying that, how could he have done khuruj when he didn't even give bay'ah? Okay, no problem. For example, 50% of the population doesn't give bay'ah to any Muslim state. Okay, whereas 50% of the population do. So based on your understanding, 
those 50% that don't give bay'ah, if they rebel against the ruler, are not khawarij. Because they didn't give bay'ah, according to you. And something strange as well, you mentioned in your video that we don't need to quote tarikh, because this is tarikh. But then you quote Ibn, and you said Ibn Khuldun again, it's Khaldun. But you quote Ibn Khaldun, and it's tarikh. <laughs> are you listening to yourself when you speak? I've heard many people say you're not, you know, I don't want to say anything more, but you know, so it like, mate, so it like. So as you can see, it's nonsensical. Now let's talk about Syria. The people of Syria having given bay'ah to Bashar al-Assad. So based on your ridiculous logic again, they're not khawarij because they didn't give bay'ah. Do you understand? Yeah, I think you need to really focus and concentrate before you speak. Because like I said, what's given to you, it's not from you, is it? No, what's in front of you is not by you, is it? We know this. Now to be honest, my friend, whoever's handed you this script, Either you didn't read it properly or they didn't do a good job. And it's probably the same of your bootlickers, you know, that are, you know, preserving the tyrant rulers in, uh, in the countries that you love so much, okay? So it's the same principle, isn't it? No standard, no credibility, no consistency. So just take it easy, my brother. Okay, let's listen to another video of his. We'll expose him some more. Take a listen to this. That's the other direction, brother. You have to maybe get a map or something so you can kind of see where this is going. How can you say he went to rebel against Yazid? He went to fight against Yazid. He didn't even go to Yazid. He went to Iraq. Different direction. And why did he go there? He didn't go there to fight Yazid. It's because the people of Iraq, they deceived him. And to show you he didn't go to fight against Yazid and he didn't go to rebel against Yazid, who did he take with him? Did he take a grandiose army? He took his family members. Hussein عنه, did not do khuruj because he went to Iraq instead of Syria. And he took his family and children. Again, ignorance. Let's now present you something which will clarify Hukbatu min al-Tariq by Sheikh Uthman al-Khamiz. Okay? And let me, let me, let's go back because you try to fool your audience. Okay, by saying Hussein who went to Iraq instead of going to Damascus and where was his, was his troops, etc. They said that the people of Iraq used to send letters to Hussein to the point that they mentioned in their letters and they said that the letters that he received from the people of Kufa said that we want to give bay'ah to you and no one other than you and we do not have on our neck the bay'ah to Yazid and we will only give it to you. Sheikh Uthman al-Khamis mentioned that the letters were so much that it reached over 500 letters. That's how much letters came. He sent his cousin, Muslim bin Aqil, to assess the situation. Okay, to assess the situation. And it says that so many people came to pledge to Muslim bin Aqil for bay'ah of Hussein. Okay, for bay'ah of Hussein. And even a companion by the name of Nu'man bin Bashir then it states, okay, Uthman al Khamis is saying this, that it says, بعد أن استقرت الأمور وباع كثير من الناس لمسلم بن عقيل. It says that when the matter was settled and loads of people gave bay'ah to Muslim bin Aqil, has now is ready for what? To topple Yazid because they said we don't want Yazid, we want you. So why did he leave to go to Kufa? Because all the manpower was in Kufa ready for him. Okay, he, they, he wasn't going to take his family to Syria to fight because all the manpower was in Iraq. And if you know the history, Ali anhu had his capital in Kufa. And when he was martyred, Hassan had his capital in Kufa. So the people of Kufa were naturally inclined towards Ahl al-Bayt. So hence he took his family to settle into Kufa, where all the men were ready. When he was finally stopped by Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, he said, let me go to Yazid and give my hand to him or send me to Jihad so I can obviously go to the fronts or I'll go back to Mecca. Why? Because the people of Kufa betrayed him. Oh, the essence of Hussein radiallahu anhu leaving Mecca and going to Iraq because all the men were there who pledged to Muslim bin Aqil to topple Yazid because they wasn't happy with him. So Hukba bin al-Tariq my friend, okay? Go learn some Tariq, okay? Without, you know, distorting facts. Also, if you want to listen to this video here, Abdullah ibn Zubair, anhu, you mentioned that he didn't give bay'ah 
and that he gave bayah afterwards. So before I you know go into it, listen to the video. Initially he didn't give bayah to Yazid, but eventually he did. So again he came back from it. Not only that, when he stood up for leadership, it was not during the time when Yazid was alive, Yazid died. Yazid had a son called Muawiyah, his son also died. Once they died, then he stood up. He saw Banu Umayyah crumbling, then he stood up. After the death of two leaders before him. So as you heard that one man mentioned that Yazid or Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhumah didn't give bay'ah but then afterwards gave bay'ah and he didn't take leadership until after the two Khalifs died. Again, ignorant of history. Why? Because after the Battle of Karbala, the people of Medina um, rebelled against Bani Umayyah. Okay? They rebelled against them because of the killing of Hussein. Anhu. And Abdullah ibn Zubair was invoking or gathering a rebellion. He wasn't in agreement with Yazid. Okay, and thereafter there was another companion that was in the Battle of Harra, Abdullah ibn Hamdala radiallahu anhuma. Okay, Abdullah ibn Hamdala radiallahu anhuma. He also rebelled and was martyred in the Battle of Harra. So, Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhuma rebelled against Yazid before he passed away. He rebelled against Yazid before he passed away. And when Yazid went to pursue Abdullah ibn Zubayr radiallahu anhu, he died before they captured him and then Muawiyah bin Yazid took control and he was only in control for a short time but your uh, premise that Abdullah bin Zubair uh, gave bay'ah to Yazid that is not true so as you can see so far so many distortions so many fabrications so many lies and I'm only just getting started okay I'm only just getting started now we're staying on that woman's statement where he said you could become a Khariji by speaking against the ruler because of your tongue. <laughs> okay? So we're sticking on that for now. So you've already called Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anhuma Khawarij. Okay? You distorted history. And now we're going to show you that companions also criticize the rulers of their time openly. So it's not looking good, my friend. So let's get this. This is Sahih Muslim. Okay, this is Sahih Muslim. It's the, it's the Sharh, uh, it's the Sharh and Nawawi, but it's obviously Sahih Muslim. I'm just going to get to this hadith. There's a hadith in here, hadith number 874. You can see on screen. It says here that Umar bin Ruwayba saw Bishr bin Marwan on the pulpit raising his hands. Now, Bishr Marwan was the son of Marwan ibn Hakam, okay, who was the Emir of Iraq. So he was a ruler. Okay. He saw Bishop bin Marwan on the pulpit raising his hands and he said, Allah disfigure these hands. I have seen Allah's messenger gesture no more than with his hands and he pointed with his forefinger. So Bishop bin Marwan, who was the leader at the time and a Sahabi by the name of Umara bin Ruwayba, basically asked Allah to disfigure those hands. So rem remember what you said? You can't even if you speak with your tongue. Okay, so is he a Khariji now? Okay, is he a Khariji? You gotta stick to by your principle, my friend. You gotta stick by your principle. Now, Imam Nawawi also mentions in Sahih Muslim, okay, and he mentions a hadith under page 200, uh, sorry, a hadith number 2989. And the narration goes as follows is Osama bin Zaid obviously was asked um, by Shaqiq. Obviously, he asked um, Osama bin Zaid that why don't you enter upon Uthman and speak to him? Okay, so Osama bin Zaid said, "Ala tarawna anni la ukallimuhu illa usmi'ukum, illa usmi'ukum." Okay, he said, "Don't you think I have not talked to him, but that I have made you here?" And Imam Nawawi explains this hadith. Listen to this, and he talks about the different manuscripts. And if you go down. It states that in it is the adab of speaking to the Umara with kindness and advising them secretly. Then it says, Imam Nawawi, listen to this. Imam Nawawi says, it says that if you're unable to advise them privately, then you should admonish them what? 
Wal inkaru fal yaf alhu a'laniyatan. If you can't do it privately, then you should admonish them openly. Okay? Openly. This is Imam Nawawi's shar. Also, Ibn Mulaqqan. Okay? Ibn Mulaqqan also mentions this and states the same thing that if you can't advise them or admonish them secretly and reject, then then do this openly. Okay? Then do this openly. So, so he's already accused Hassan al Hussein of becoming a Khariji. Okay? Also, the other companion that said disfigure his hands. And Imam Nawawi is saying that if you can't advise them privately or silently for their you know, transgressions, then do inkar of them openly. Okay? But don't you say, oh, you know, I'll grab them by the hand and take them quite privately. I'm going to get to the hadith anyway, whether it's authentic or not. Now, let's go to another video. Alhamdulillah. Now listen to this blunder he does now as well. What was his sin? What was his bid'ah? What was his transgression? The fact that he thought the Prophet وسلم, was an oppressive leader. He said, I'dil ya Muhammad, lam ta'dil. He said, be just, O Muhammad. The justice is the opposite of oppression, right? He said, you're being oppressive, Muhammad. Be just. Lam ta'dil, because you've not been just. So he became labeled from that day as the father of the Khawarij, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that from him is going to come X, Y, Z, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he went into the description of what the Khawarij would be. Now you heard him say that Dhul, Dhul, not Dhu, my friend, Dhul Khuwaisara was the father of the Khawarij. Now Dhul Khuwaisara is the forefather of the Khawarij. But there's an opinion as well. Again, you don't like to mention these. This is why I've come out openly and started speaking that there's a difference and there's no ijma'ah. And I'm going to get to your ijma'ah as well. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it just yet. So, Dhul Khawaisara, you said he's the father of the Khawarij, and obviously you mentioned that point. Now, you do know there's an opinion that Dhul Khawaisara wasn't a Khawarijji. He ignores the fact that many of the ulama say that Dhul Khawaisara was the forefather of the Khawarij. He was the forefather. He was not actually a Khawarijji himself. He was the forefather of the Khawarij. But little do you know, my friend, because everything's scripted for you, that many scholars have mentioned that he wasn't even a Khariji, he was a Munafiq, okay? He was an actual Munafiq, okay? So this is Sahih al-Bukhari, okay? In Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, he mentions the story of Dhul Khawaisra, which you mentioned already, and where he said, I'dil. The hadith number 6933, by the way. And at the end of the hadith, after explaining the, uh, the Khawarij, obviously their uh, attributes, Abu Sa'id mentioned that the following verses were revealed in connection with that very person. And the ayat was that from amongst them, okay, meaning who accuse you in the matters of distribution. So the ayat that came down on this very man, about this very man to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was in relation to him being a munafiq. Okay, now to make it clearer, okay, to make it clearer, Ibn Taymiyyah in his book, Asarim al Muslul, okay, Asarim al Muslul. On the page 425, Ibn Taymiyyah says that it is textually proven that this man is from the hypocrites. Okay, and he mentions the ayat, uh, as I mentioned before, and among them are men who accuse you, obviously, of Muhammad وسلم, in the matter of distribution. Ibn Kathir, okay, Ibn Kathir, okay, and as you can see the screenshot. So, in Tafsir Ibn Kathir, as you can see, where he quotes the ayat that amongst the men are those who accuse you in the matter of distribution. And Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, says, وَيَقُولُ تَعَالَى وَمِنْهُمْ And from amongst them, أَيْ وَمِنَ الْمُنَافِقِينَ From the munafiqeen. Okay? So when that ayat came down, when it said from amongst them are men, and when Ibn Kathir comments on this, from, min, from amongst them, he said from the munafiqeen. He doesn't say from the khawarij. From the Munafiqeen. And then if you go further, as you can read from the screenshot, Ibn Kathir mentioned an Abi Sa'id, okay, and he mentions the story of Dhul Khawaisra in relation to this ayat about the Munafiqeen, okay. So as you can see quite clearly that there's an opinion that Dhul Khawaisra was a Munafiq and he was the forefather of the Khawarij and he himself was an Akhariji, okay. So when you use that narration regarding he was the Khariji, the first Khariji. There's a difference of opinion, my friend. Now, just for the record, I'm not calling for khuruj. All I merely did 
will present evidence with confirmation, you've confirmed it as well, that the Salaf did rebel, the early Salaf rebel, the companions rebel against the oppressive rulers. I'm not calling for Khuruj. I'm not calling for it at all. And as you always label people Khariji, make tabdi'ah, which is not even a mushtahid anyway. You label people Khariji, you label me a Khariji, and I haven't even called for Khuruj. Okay? So all I said was that this is fact, factual that the companions rebelled. So if you True and sincere, why is it that you don't call them khawarij and you call everyone else khawarij? Why, is, why the double standards? If they rebelled and they went against the text, why do you say it's just a mistake and it was ijtihad or ta'wil? Okay, well if you want to use that argument, the people of today that rebel against the oppressive rulers made the ijtihad and made ta'wil as well. Now as I demonstrated from Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Kathir and uh, Abu Sa'id that mentions obviously that the ayat that came down which mentions that Dhul Khwaisara Dhul Khwaisara was a Munafiq not a Khariji I'm just pre merely presenting it to you I'm not saying your opinion is wrong but then you're gonna jump down my throat and say look look he mentioned he's a Munafiq it's not me that mentioned it mate it's three of, or shall I say two major Imams and one Hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari now that our man mentioned that and he admitted that when the Salaf did rebel they rebelled because they made takfir of Hajjaj. Okay, they make takfir of Hajjaj. And that, to be honest, is insincere. Because I presented proof, Tariq al Tabari, okay, that Saeed bin Jubair, and you can see the screenshot, okay, that that's not entirely true. Whilst they admitted and they believed he was a kafir, the reason and the other reason and the overriding reason why they rebelled against Hajjaj was because he was oppressive. And it states here, and, and if you read it, the screenshot's there. For wallahi ma a'lamu qawman ala basit al-ard a'lamu bidhulm. That I do not find, I swear by Allah, I do not find a people on the face of the earth that practice oppression. Why did you miss that out? It wasn't just kufr, was it? That he was oppressive. Huge oppression. They say, they estimate that Hajjaj killed between 10 and 10,000 people to 100,000 people. Now you can imagine 10,000 people at that time is still a huge number and 100,000 people. So it wasn't because he was a kafir. Now also Saeed ibn Jubair also mentioned that the people fought Hajjaj because of his transgressions. So presenting the argument that they fought him only for kufr is insincere. It's a lie and it's a fabrication. And I mentioned in a previous uh, book that 4,000 from the best of the Tabi'un and the Tabi'een rebelled from their reciters and their fuqaha. Why did they rebel? Because of his kufr? Because of his oppression. So, I ask you a question now. This is a question from me to you. Okay. That if the Salaf did khuruj, okay, and you admit that, the Salaf did do khuruj, okay, did that make them khawarij? Okay. Now, if you say they were mistaken, okay, by you, they were mistaken, okay, no problem. But then be consistent in your reasoning. Be consistent in your reasoning. And call those who hold the same opinion as mistaken and not khawarij. Not difficult, is it? So if they were mistaken, was the son of khawarij, yes or no? Because you say anyone with their tongue. Okay? Were they khawarij, yes or no? And if you said they were mistaken, they made a mistake. Okay? Then that's fine. So so did the people that are, that are doing it today. They're mistaken, they're not khawarij. It's just a simple, it's, it's just you're loose with your tongue. You're very, very you know, harsh and arrogant and disrespectful. Okay, so let's move on. The hadith, man arada an yansah, al, uh, the hadith that whoever wants to advise his ruler should do it privately. Al Albani did tashih of it, but others didn't. And as you can see from the screenshot, Sheikh Khalid Al Hayik, uh, Sheikh Khalid Al Hayik, done a full takhrij saying that this is unauthentic. Okay, and as you can see from the screen. Now. He accused me of missing out stuff regarding Ibn Abdul Bar's statement and Imam Qurtubi's statement. So I just like, I want to address that. First and foremost, okay, I didn't miss anything out from Ibn Abdul Bar. The only reason why I didn't quote that was because Shamsi went to that particular part. So what I did was I quoted the part that agreed with what I was saying in relation to that the Salaf did Khuruj and they used the ayat from the Quran that Allah's covenant does not extend to the oppressive people. And I quoted that. Now, you're saying this is, the mother, uh, this is the madhab of the khawarij because having common attributes, okay, having common attributes with other sects doesn't mean that you're from amongst them. 
To share common attributes with other sects does not mean that you're from amongst them. For example, let me give you an example. The Asha'ara, the position of the Asha'ara and the Sahaba, we agree with them, don't we? We in, are in agreement with the Asha'ara in relation to the Sahaba. Now, does that mean now that the Athariya and the Asha'ara? We could agree. Doesn't mean that because we agree we're now from each other. Now, the Asha'ara, Athari, or the Ashara are apart from the uh, um, the Ashara are now Athari, uh, Atharis and the Atharis are now from the Ashara. Doesn't work like that. Ibn Hajr confirms that. Ibn Hajr confirms in his Tahdib al Tahdib, he states that rebelling was the Madhab of the Salaf. Now, who do we trust? Ibn Hajr al Asqalani or Da'waman? Who do we trust? Who do we take? Ibn Hajr is saying this. But you're saying no, Ibn Hajar made a mistake. So as I told you before, my friend, you just stick to your shenanigans and talk about husbands getting penetrated by their wives. Okay, just stick to that, mate. Just stick to that. Now I ask you, okay, I admit that this was the madhab of the Mu'tazila and the Khawarij. But by sharing common attributes doesn't mean that you're from amongst them. Now I ask you, my brother, did this early Salaf have Khawarij tendencies? Because you're promoting this, you're saying this was the madhab of the Mu'tazila, this was the madhab of the Khawarij. So did the Salaf have, early Salaf have Khawariji tendencies? Or were they from the Mu'tazila? Because you're promoting that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, yes, that was the madhab of the Mu'tazila, but they were the madhab of the early Salaf as well. It's a simple yes or no. And please name the Salaf Khawarij. Stick to your principles, my friend. Stick to your principles. Okay? Okay, now we we'll listen to Da'waman now. Okay, we we'll listen to Da'waman. All the previous quotes of scholars that I mentioned was the common view, the majority, the overwhelming majority view, which was that going against the oppressive, tyrannical Muslim ruler is something that is not allowed and it's an innovation. Then there was a small view, a minority view, a fringe view of those who said, or they, not necessarily said, but through their actions, they went against or seemed to go against their ruler. Now as you heard, Da'waman mentioned that there was a fringe group, a minority group. So he finally admitted that there was a group from the Salaf that rebelled, from the early Salaf that rebelled against their ruler. But he said it was a fringe group. Now he quoted Ibn Taymiyyah's and there was a passage that he was using, okay? But in that passage, there was something very important that he didn't even realize that was there. As you can see the passage from Ibn Taymiyyah's quote, the highlighted part clearly states that those who fought in the fitna were a huge number, okay? Were a huge number from the people of knowledge and religion. Ibn Taymiyyah is saying that. The ones who fought in the fitna was a huge number. But you said it was only a fringe group, a minority group. Okay? Now to back this even further, okay, to back this up even further, we go to Al Bidaya wa Nihaya. Okay? Okay, here's my Bidaya wa Nihaya. Okay? Al Bidaya wa Nihaya. And on the page 160, okay, as you can see from the screenshot, it clearly states that and as you can see from the screenshot, it's highlighted in yellow. That they say, Hatta qila innahu sara ma'ahu. That when they're talking about Ibn Ashath, the rebellion of Ibn Ashath, it is said that those who were with him were 33,000 knights. So Ibn Taymiyyah goes, it was a large group, okay, of people from the people of knowledge and religion. And Ibn, Ibn Kathir, in his Bidaya wa Nihaya mentioned there was 33,000, in one instance by the way, this is one instant, 33,000 knights. And how many was there in total? There was over 120,000 men. Okay, 120,000 men. 33,000 knights and 120,000 men. Well, to be honest, that was a large fringe group, don't you think? Okay, and also as you can see from the screenshot, okay, it's also in... Tariq al-Islam, Tariq al-Islam by Imam al-Dahabi and he also mentions as well 
that from the fuqaha and the ulama that rebelled, there was all over uh, 33,000 knights and over 120,000 men. Okay, so very, very fringe group indeed. Okay, now, subhanAllah al this is where the deceit will be exposed clearly. Okay, we will expose this dishonesty, disingenuous people. Because you notice anyone that rebels, okay, against the oppressive ruler, they are quick to label them khawarij. They've been quite insincere in relation to those who rebel with a just cause against an oppressive ruler. And their tongues, you know, they slander by calling them khawarij. Now, I know you know that there's two types of groups that rebel. But let me rephrase that. I know the one that writes your script knows. Okay, I know the one that writes your script knows about this. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to present this to you. And I'm going to mention to you regarding the two groups. And what are they? One is Khawarij and the other is Bughat. What did the ulama say about these two groups? Let's go and look. Okay. Now Ibn Taymiyyah, in, in Kitab al furu by Ibn Muflih. Okay, as you can see on screen. وَلِهَادَ قَالَ شَيْخُنَا شَيْخُنَا meaning Ibn Taymiyyah. يُفَرِّقُ جَمْحُورُ عُلَمَا بَيْنَ الْخَوَارِجْ وَبُغَاتِ الْمُتَأَوَّلِينَ That the majority, our Shaykh, meaning Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al-Islam, rahimahullah, said that the majority of the ulama distinguished between the khawarij and the rebels who are making interpretation. You see? That there was a difference between the two. They both go out against their ruler. Okay, they both go out against their ruler. But the ulama made a distinction between a rebel that makes ta'wil and the khawarij. Why didn't you inform your audience about this? And then he further goes on to say, he says, وَهُوَ الْمَعْرُوفُ عَنِ sahaba And this is known amongst the sahaba. وَعَلَيْهِ عَامَةُ أَحْلِ hadith. So this is known amongst the sahaba. Look at this. It was known amongst the sahaba that there's two types of groups. That Rabbah, one's a Khawarij and one's a Bukhat that makes interpretations. And this was known amongst the Ahlul Hadith from the Fuqaha and the Mutakallim and the majority and a lot of the Imams that follow them from the Ashab Ahmed and other than them. Why didn't you inform your people that there's two types of people that Rabbah? And this is under the chapter of Bab al Qital al Ahlul Baghi, that those who fight the, rebel, the, the rebels, okay, the ones that go on Rabbah. Let's go on further now, subhanAllah. As you can see on screen, the book. Al-Mughli Muhtaj, okay, he says, and as you can see the screenshot, he says the rebels are those Muslims who have gone against the head of state. Muslims, didn't call him Khawarij, okay? Even if he's oppressive and the rebels are just, according to Al-Qafal. The rebels are what? Just, according to Al-Qafal. However, Ibn Al-Qashayri transmits from the majority of the Shafi'iyyah and that which is in the great commentary and al rawda that they are rebels only if the head of state ruler is just. Likewise, this is the criteria mentioned in Al-Um and Al-Mukhtasar. In that which is intended is the leader of the legitimate just party, so there is no contradiction. Now, now we're going to get to your Ijma'ah now. So as you can see, the rebels are those Muslims, not Khawarij, who have gone against the head of state, even if he's oppressive, and the rebels are just. Okay, the rebels are just. Not the dogs of the Halfaya. Not... Uh, Glad tidings to kill them who get killed by them. They are just. Now listen to this. As you can see, Al-Shirbin is carrying on. The evidence that is cited is the statement of the author, meaning Imam Nawawi, in his commentary of Sahih Muslim. Rebelling against the head of state ruler and fighting them is impermissible according to the consensus of the Muslims. Now this is where we're going to get to the Ijma'a now. That Imam Nawawi did say this. But listen to this. However, this consensus has been disputed. You heard? However, this consensus has been disputed by what? Why is it disputed? By the rebellion of Al Hussein against Yazid, the son of Muawiyah, who you said made a mistake. And what else? This, this is disputed. Why? And Ibn Zubair against Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Okay, so this consensus is disputed based on the fact of the early Salaf's actions. What I've been saying all along that is no ijma'ah. And Al-Sharbini confirms this. So you send the ijma'ah, we've got one alim now that's, breaking, that's broken this ijma'ah. 
Okay? This ijma has been broken, and this ain't the only one. Listen to this as well. Subhanallah al So let's go back. He says that the evidence that is cited is the statement of the author in his commentary in Sahih Muslim, meaning Imam Nawawi, rebelling against the head of state, ruler, and fighting them is impermissible according to the consensus of the Muslims. However, this consensus has been disputed by the rebellion of Al Hussein against Yazid, the son of Muawiyah, and Ibn Zubair against Abdul Malik bin, uh, Abdul Malik bin Marwan. And they were both supported by a huge number of the Salaf. Okay? They were supported. They were both, listen, they were both supported by a huge number of the Salaf. Now I'm going to ask you, my brother, who knows the statements of a Nawawi more than the Ashab of the Madhab? And Al Khatib said what Hussein anhu, did, and Ibn Zubair, what they did was Khuruj. So do you know more than them, my brother? As I mentioned before, my dear brother, this is way above your pay grade, my friend. You just stick to three sums and penetration of, of wives and their husbands. You just stick to that, mate, okay? That's where you, you're good at, okay? Just stick there, okay? Even the ones that are writing the script for you need to sort of tweak, you know, a little bit of things. Now, alhamdulillah, we're talking about the Bugat, the rebels, which you guys have never mentioned. Have they ever mentioned this, my brother? Never! You never mention that anyone that rebels against the ruler, there's two types. There's Khawarij and Bugat. You never mention that. Now let me educate you even further. Fathul Bari by Ibn Hajar Al-Asqalani. By Ibn Hajar Al-Asqalani. Okay? In volume 15 of my book, okay? Listen to this. This is really, really, really going to shock you. Okay? Okay. And Ibn Hajar Al-Asqalani mentions in Fathul Bari. He says, وَقَالَ الْغَزَالِ فِي الْوَصِيطِ he mentions in his book Wasid that the ruling regarding the Khawarij are of two angles. Look at this. The ruling regarding the Khawarij are of two angles. When have we ever heard you say this? Never. It says, and you can see from the screenshot, one of them, the ruling upon them is Ahlul Ridda, that you apply the Ridda. Wasani, and the second of them, and the other one is the people of rebellion, okay, Baghi, the rebels. Okay, so one is Ahl Ridda and the other is the Baghi. And he mentions obviously about the story about the, the, the two types that rebelled uh, for, the, for seeking of kingdom and etc. And there's another group that rebel. Listen to this Rebel, Kharaju. He says that the people of Haq that rebel. Now, can I ask you a question? How can those who rebel be the people of Haq? Just out of curiosity. This is why Ibn Hajar is quoting from Al Ghazali. And then he mentions the people of Medina, in Harra, and the reciters, the Rabalikas, Hajjaj, etc., etc. So this is Ibn Hajar Asqalani uh, mentioning Al Ghazali that those who rebelled are two types. We never heard you mention any of the sort, my friend. Now, the understanding of the Salaf was preserved by these schools of fiqh. Okay? The understanding of the Salaf was preserved by these schools of fiqh. And also, in, in in Insaf and Muntaha and Al Mughni, they mention three types of people who go against the leader. Those that have no evidence whatsoever, they are highway robbers. Okay? So they are the ones that have no evidence, they just rub out, they are highway robbers. And the others that make takfir, and they are the khawarij. And the third are the bughat who have a legitimate dalil. These guys are not made tabdi of, and their witness testimony is not rejected. When have we heard? You or any of your cronies differentiate between those who rebel into different groups. You and the one that writes your script for you. Okay? You and the one that writes your script for you. When have we ever heard you differentiate between those who rebel? Because those who have a legitimate dalil are not called khawarij. And I honestly believe those who rebel with their ishtihad, again, because if you say that the Salaf made ta'weel, when they rebelled, and many statements have, have, have come out confirming that they've, obviously from the books that they've rebelled. But you say, oh, that was the ta'weed and they, they, they were mistaken. So likewise, have that, apply that same standard and say, those of today who made, who are oppressed and they make ijtihad are also mistaken and not khawarij. Why have you got one standard for one generation and another standard for another? Whereas the ulama are saying there's different groups that rebel. So... As you say to, as you mentioned that Imam Hussein who made a mistake, okay, just like that, he made a mistake. So why don't you say the same thing about those of today? They made a mistake as well. 
Why do you label them Khawarij but not La and not mention Imam Hussein? He did the same thing. He went out and rebelled. And as I mentioned before, he had manpower in Kufa when they gave him bay'ah. The actual uh, quote from uh, Hukbat Minit Tariq said he ha they gave him bay'ah when Muslim bin Aqil went. And you didn't mention that. You know, deceitfully, you didn't mention that. Okay, now we go to Al-Rawda of Imam al-Nawawi. Okay, and as you can see from the screenshots. So Imam al-Nawawi in his Rawda, okay, mentions, and just to note, that those who rebel with the just cause are not considered khawarij. Okay, and if you listen, if you read the, the highlighted part, it states, you don't make takfir of the baghi. And also Imam Nawawi mentions that our companions have mentioned that the uh, rebel is not to be named with criticism. And that the rebels are not sinful. Okay? And they are not to be called with kufr. Why? Because they are mistaken. They are mistaken. So just say for hypothetically you disagree with them. Okay? Just say you disagree with them. Which is fine. You can do. Why is it that you're quick to label them khawarij? Well, Imam Nawawi is saying, and there's different groups that rebel, okay? They're saying, the Imam Nawawi is saying, you don't, even, you don't even criticize them. You don't even label them with sin. You don't even accuse them of kufr. But they are mistaken, okay? Also, Imam Nawawi mentions, who are the Bughat? And he mentions that, Anna yakuna lahum ta'wil. Imam Nawawi also mentions who are the Bughat now. So Imam Nawawi clarifies who are the Bughat. And Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah, clarifies that if there is a cause or a reason to the rebellion against the head of state or ruler, then if it's speculative or subjective, then there is some legitimacy and the head of state is obliged to give them a legitimate hearing. Okay? Imam Nawawi is saying this. So, Khawarij! Khawarij! Where's your leniency? Where's your leniency? Do, do you not study? Do you not know this? You're quick to label them khawarij, but look what Imam Nawawi is saying. And Imam Nawawi's ijma'ah we're going to get to as well. Don't you worry about it. Okay? We're going to get to the ijma'ah, so don't think I forgot about that. Okay, so he says that there's some legitimacy, okay? And the state and the ruler is obliged to give them a legitimate hearing. Okay? So the state... So hold on, where does it say Imam Nawawi says it's Kilabun Nar and you know the, the dogs of the Halfaya, etc. So listen to this. However, if the cause reason to rebel has been definitely proven to be without a cause or reason, there are two options within the madhab. Now this is the Shafi'iyah. The stronger is their case is thrown out and not heard. Imam Nawawi is saying this. And the other opinion within the madhab, the case is required to be taken seriously and given a hearing. SubhanAllah. So you see the point here, okay? You see the point here. And just to add as well, that no one's calling for khuruj. Not once, I think, from all the conversations I had, and all the videos I've done, I haven't mentioned once that there should be khuruj in the land. What I said, and I think I've stuck by this, and the brother would agree with me, is that I said, the people who are oppressed, depending on the level of oppression, they've got the right to defend themselves. And then they say, practically, you know, it doesn't happen. Why is Hajji giving these examples? We're going to get to the reality later on in the video about the facts on the ground, okay? And how you distorted my words, you know, disrespected me, slandered me. We're going to get to that. And also at the, the, at the end of the video, I'm going to show you, obviously, the reality on the ground, you know, of those areas which you, you know, indicate that they, they, we're calling for khuruj and destruction. You, this is the issue now where I think you're, you think you've got a point in reality regarding the ijma'a. And you said there is the ijma'a. Whilst you admit that there was two groups amongst the Salaf and there was a fringe group which we debunked because 120,000 is not classed as a fringe group, my friend. And 33,000 night in one instant. You know, it's not a fringe group. Okay, you're claiming ijma. Okay, you're claiming ijma. Is danni or qat'i? Was there ijma in the first place? So now let's look at those who rejected the ijma. Okay, that came after. If you, if you read Ibn Wazir's book, Al-Awasim Wal-Qawasim, and as you can see in the screenshot, he quotes Ibn Hazm, okay, who basically debunked this whole concept of Ijma'ah that you're claiming. Okay, Ibn Hazm. Okay. Now as you can see from the screenshot, Imam Shawkani, in his book, Fisilul Jarar, 
mentions regarding Imam Nawawi's Ijma'ah. Okay? And he mentions that Imam Nawawi's Ijma'ah is not an Ijma'ah that is spoken uh, about, that which is spoken about the ulama as evidence. Okay? And he, he basically disputes it. So, Imam Shawkani also disputes this Ijma'ah from Imam Nawawi. And also, as you can see, there's a PDF, there's a two volume bath, and it's titled Al Ijma'ah in the Imam al Nawawi, Min Khilali Sharhihi. This Sahil Muslim, and this is Darasa al Usuliya Tatbiqiya. This is a Darasa, meaning a, a, a bath, a research that was carried out regarding Imam Nawawi's uh, so called Ijma'ah, and basically it's not correct. Okay? Now, as you can see as well, Al Muallimi in his Tankil, okay? Al Muallimi in his At Tankil also rejects his Ijma'ah. The Ijma'ah you're trying to promote isn't an Ijma'ah. From amongst the mutaakhirun. Okay, I wanna. <laughs> I know conveniently you missed out my Ibn Hazm uh, book that I quoted. Al Fisal. Okay, is Al Fisal or Al Fasal? Okay, and the reason why I said Al Fasal because I've heard that alim mention it, so hence I've continued it on because it's the most correct way, and sh and that's why I've used that. But anyway, let's now give you an example. Okay, I'm gonna give them an example now, mixed with a little twist. Okay. Is Al Fisal, okay? Al Fisal, and in actual fact, Al Fasal. But here you go, Al Fisal. So don't think I didn't know it was Al Fisal. In his Al Milan Al Nihal, says it Al Fasal. So anyway, Ibn Hazm, obviously, you rudely and with all arrogance stated where he mentioned that there's over 45 companions and, and Tabi'un that rebelled or call for revolt you said Ibn Hazm was wrong okay well you know more than Ibn Hazm okay no problem so I want to ask you a question because I know you know you're not really that jealous of your women folk because one of your you know box headed Salafis said he'll leave his wife if an army came to take her and he wouldn't defend her or he will defend her only up until the front door and then after that obviously whatever happens happens and I just want to clarify that as well. Uh, you slandered me by saying uh, I belittle rape, murder uh, for the Syrian uh, in relation to the Syrian revolution. First and foremost, the comment Sar Masar was in relation to the boys that were taken into prison and tortured. And I mentioned what happened happened with them. Nothing to do with the revolution, nothing to do with what transpired with the uh, uh, abuses by Bashar's army and the Shabbiha. So, again, you want to point score and be cheap, no problem. Now, let's ask you a question now, okay? And I'm going to get the example from here. So, just say, for example, there is a government, there's a Sufi government, okay? There's a Sufi government. And the Salafis were all gathered in one place, like, for example, Najat, okay? Najat, for example. And... Everywhere else is Sufi Qaburis, okay? And the Hakim ordered for the Salafis to be killed. Okay, I'm giving a hypothetical example here. Can they defend themselves? Because you said you can't go against the Hakim. Like I said, no matter what the Hakim is, you guys recommend and endorse every type of oppressor that is known to man. So if the Sufi is ruling, he's a Hakim, isn't he? You know, unless he shows Kufr and Buwahan, he, 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 you can't rebel against him. So, when we say Sufi, you know, it doesn't mean that he's a Kaburi. We're saying he's a Sufi, like, for example, you know, a Ghazali, he's Ashari, for example. Okay? A better example would be an Ashari government. Okay? It's an Ashari government. The same government that Ibn Taymiyyah lived under, the Mamalik. Okay? So, he orders the Salafis to be killed. And, obviously, you guys ain't got the power to defend yourselves. Do you fight back? Yes or no? Let's give you another example, okay? Let's add another one, okay? I like to add my little examples because at the end of the day, it's based on principle and standing. It's not, it's not hypothetical, you know. You might think, oh, well, it don't happen. I think I'm going to educate you uh, later down the video, okay? So just say like Yemen, okay? Yemen, for example, it's the Sufis and the Salafis are all in the match, okay? The Sufis and the Salafis are in the match. And they were ordered by the Hakim to be killed. And there won't be any Salafis left in Yemen. So the Sufis and Salafis are in one place. And the, the Hakim, who is Ashari, sends the troops to kill the Salafis. Are they allowed to defend themselves? <laughs> yeah, even if he flogs you back and takes you off. Yes or no? If you say yeah, then 
Okay, defend yourselves in your homes. But what if he abuses you and, and carries on this oppression? What do you do after? Do you do the same or no? Now, I'm going to go now to Ibn Hazm's example, okay? <laughs> Ibn Hazm. In his fissile. Alright? Behave yourselves. Okay, here you go. Al fissile. Okay? Or al fasl. Whatever you want to say. So l let's uh, give you the example now. Okay. Now. I'm going to ask that same question again. Okay, so let's, let's pose this to these individuals. Okay, here's the screenshot. Okay, so let's, let's get an answer. It will be said to them, this is from Ibn Hazm in his fissil, or fossil, however you want to say it. What did you say about a sultan who puts the Jews in charge, makes the Christian his army, forces the Muslims to pay the jizya, raises weapons against Muslim children, and demands Muslim women to fornicate? Holds arms against the Muslims, captures their women and children, front door, anyway, and is publicly perverse with them. But in all of that, he still agrees with Islam outwardly and, can, and he continues to pray. So, what do you do? Do you still obey him? So, he's doing all of these fawahish, you know, he's forcing Muslims to pay jizya and he raises Muslim weapons against Muslim children, demands Muslim to, women to fornicate. Holds arms against the Muslim, catch, captures their women and children, and is probably perverse with them. But in spite of all of that, he agrees with Islam outwardly and continues to pray. What do you do? So look what Ibn Hazm says. If they say it's not permissible to rise against him, then it should be said he will continue killing Muslims until he is the only one who remains with him and Ahl al-Kufr along with him. And if they permit having sabr in that situation, meaning the one that I've just read out, then they would have opposed Islam and abandoned it. Okay? So, you, without even sort of getting your answer, like you avoided the question, I guarantee you'll say, have sabr. But even Hazm says, you would have opposed Islam. Okay? You would have opposed Islam. And this is the point. You guys have just become so subservient, you know, and you've got no principles that every, you've, you've held the ruler above your heads. And they're tyrants, at the end of the day. They're tyrants. Anyway, so we further ask them about one whose wife, daughter, son, and himself are abducted by a corrupt sultan, so that he could be sexually perverse with them. Should he surrender himself, his wife, his son, and his daughter to this evil? Or is he fard upon him to defend against whoever wanted this? If they say he's fard upon him to surrender himself and his family, they would have said something terrible that no Muslim says. But if they say he's fard upon him to fight, then they return to the truth, and they must say the same thing about every Muslim, i.e. defending each other, as Muslims are brothers in person, and property. Okay, so just remember, we want an answer to that. We want to see if you if you got any respect for your own loved ones. Okay? <laughs> Alright, let's get to his uh, comment now. Da'aman, subhanAllah. He mentions uh, in the video, we'll play it for you. Okay? In regards to Egypt. Okay? He mentions uh, a comment uh, in relation to Egypt. So let's listen to him. You didn't stop when it happened in what? Tunisia. You wanted Tunisia to burn. Libya, you wanted it to burn. Egypt, subhanAllah, Allah saved it from becoming as bad as the rest of the places. Syria, you wanted it to burn. Yemen, you let it burn. And you now, as you heard, he went on a little a bit of an emotional rant. He said, uh, Tunisia, you wanted it to burn. Uh, Libya, you wanted it to burn. Syria, you wanted it to burn. Are you, are you mentally stable? Are you feeling okay? And you also accused me of, you know, you would want... Uh, women being raped in front of the Kaaba. Are you, are you stable in the head? I think you need to be put in a straitjacket. You know, you're, you're not right in the head, my friend. So let's talk about Egypt being saved. Subhanallah al-Azim. First of all, they've gone against their whole principle. And you allied with secularists. I'm not supporting Mursi. I'm just going by your principle here. That the Salafi Noor party allied with secularists, liberalists. And every group on the face of the earth to get rid of Ra'is Mursi. And then you said, Allah saved Egypt. So can I ask you a question? Do you know what happened in a Rabi'ah wa Nahda? Do you know what happened? Do you? Okay. But I take it you don't know. So let me educate you. Okay, let me educate you. On the 14th of August 2013... Okay, on the 14th of August 2013, the Egyptian army, led by Sisi and his traitor army, 
backed by the Salafis, okay, who endorsed this rebellion, who endorsed this coup. They slaughtered over 1,100 Muslims in just over 10 hours. Inside mosques as well. Is that how Allah saved Egypt? This is how insensitive you are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Egypt. Let's see if you could say that to the family members who lost over 1,100 people in a space of 10 hours inside mosques as well. Okay? And if your own family member was in that particular mosque or in that particular location, I'm sure you won't be saying the same thing. But Allah saved Egypt through Sisi. Okay? And uh, the Rafa border. You don't know what happened with the Rafa border, do you? That border was a lifeline for the Gazans, okay, the Palestinians. Under the blockade and under the siege, they only had that particular lifeline to bring in necessity or, or necessary uh, medicine, food, and various other things. And the Egyptian people used to assist them in that, okay? What did your saviour Sisi do? He razzled that place to the ground. No life, okay? And moved the inhabitants further. So the Palestinians, once again, are left to fend for themselves with the uh, illegitimate blockade caused by the Israelis. Furthermore, okay, furthermore, you mentioned that we, w we want Egypt to, I mean, Syria to burn and, and Tunisia to burn and all these other areas to burn. First and foremost, situation, oh sorry, the Tunisia revolt. Do you know who the ruler was? He banned the hijab. Do you know this? He also banned memorization of the Quran. Sheikh Nabil al Awadi. Let's listen to him, okay? Don't take my word for it. Let's listen to him. Zain al Abidin, Turk al Qadhafi, Badi Shwainiji. Zain al Abidin, Harab al Hijab, Harab al Salah, Harab al Deen, Kulma al Ahara, Shu'iya Masawat al Isawa, or Rubba Mataf al Fila. Had a Rajul Yashik, who was the Kabla Kano, the Kabla Kan Yashab al Mafi in Haramadan al Hawa. Which were not Alas al Tarf in Haramadan. هذا الرجل بهذه الأفعال لا يحكم بشرع الله لا يؤمن بشرع الله ويحارب شرع الله سبحانه وتعالى تجعله حاكم شرعي ولي أمر له السمع والطاعة كل هذه الأعمال ما أثرت في إيمانه ولا في في, في إسلام okay so you heard زين العبدين how he was treating the Muslims but let me guess uh, شيخ نبيل العوادي from the from, from the خوارج isn't he he's a خارجي okay sorry I forgot I'm sorry I'm sorry so only you know, the little, you know, group or the cronies that you've got with you, you know, the three, four, sorry, the fifth, the one that's writing the script, are upon Ahl sunnah Do you know the reason why the Tunisian uh, or the Arab Springs died? I'll educate you. It was that boy that was being persecuted, being oppressed. We're not, I'm not, you know, talking and trying to rattle people's emotions. Adding on to this, okay, adding on to this, that there was a revolt within Saudi Arabia and, a, and, a, and a, a coup that one of the sheikhs endorsed, okay? Sheikh Mohammed bin Ibrahim. And you can see the screenshots there, okay? That they removed him from power. They removed Sheikh Malik Saud and they replaced him with Malik Faisal. So the sheikh that gave the fatwa, uh, is he not a khariji for removing, as you can see from the screenshot, okay? <laughs> so. <laughs> you guys are walking contradictions, honestly. So let's play something for you now regarding uh, a little tension between uh, two, you know, one mild bootlicker and one extreme bootlicker. Listen to this. It was him responding to a man that calls himself Shamsi. And this man Shamsi happens to be um, a member and a component to the organization on the Salafi publications. And I just want to mention outright that I have no affiliation with this individual, nor do I have any affiliation with his hizb, with this hizb. And I say hizb because, as far as we're concerned, Salafi publications and their ilk are a hizb. Because Sheikh Hussam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, is majmu' al-fatawa, he said, Ainu al that the essence of what really actually is hizbiyah is that you place love and hate based on a shakhs mu'ayyan, based on a particular individual, or a jama'a, a specific group. So with these people, if you go against their particular sheikh, because at the end of the day he's a sheikh, he's not the Prophet so if he happens to 
um, be incorrect in a particular issue and you oppose this view by taking the view of another scholar, they'll throw you off. As far as they're concerned, if you love the Sheikh, they love you. If you don't, if you have an issue with the Sheikh, they have an issue with you. And this is not anything to do with, with our deen. Because as far as we're concerned, we base love and hate with regards to your obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and your adherence to the ijma. Not only that, as far as we're concerned, these people, you know, um, they don't necessarily have the best understanding of the deen as it is anyway. It's clear with regards to the way they conduct themselves, but it's also clear with regards to their failures in actually becoming triumphant in things that they're supposed to be most well versed in. For example, this particular issue of imama and khuruj that we're about to discuss, they failed in that regard. So with that said, I hope it's clear, inshallah ta'ala, that I am not a defender of them. Okay, so, wow. Just for the record, you're the mild bootlicker, okay? You're the mild one, okay? Glad tidings to you. So what's going on here? What the hell's going on here between you guys? Do you know what I mean? At each other's throats. But to be fair, you know, you're both two sides of the same coin. There's just like, you guys could be at each other's throats, no problem. It's just like, who's more Salafi than the other? Like, I'm Salafi, and you're not Salafi, and I'm on the Manhaj, and you're not on the Manhaj. And you know, I'm going to take you off the Manhaj, and my group's only on the Manhaj. It's like cat and mice, isn't it? So, Shamsi, you know, you said that he's a Hizbi, you know, and you've accused him of all sorts. Like, I, I'm thinking to myself, like, what's going on here? Like, all because of little old me, yeah, at each other's throats. Allah. So it's, it's interesting to see why, you know, it's interesting to know why you mentioned this comment. Like, you, are, you def are, you, are you actually that against him or is he just a ploy? You know, are you just playing devil's advocate here and, uh, <laughs> and just having a little banter with each other? Regardless what it is, your situation and his situation, you, you guys are in reality causing nothing but division and friction in the ummah. Wallah al -Azim. And in, you, can't, you guys, unless we don't tow your line of thinking, unless we don't agree and comprehend your level of understanding, then we are misguided, we are, you know, off the manhaj, and there's no hope for us. Who made you guys the authority? Let me ask you this question. Who made you guys the authority? First and foremost, you both are irrelevant. You're nobodies. No, with all due respect, you know, you, you might think you're someone important within your own little circle but in reality you ain't got no value and all you do is fric cause friction and division within the ummah so it's interesting to see how shamsi comes back because if i was shamsi i wouldn't take it i wouldn't accept that because why is he called, why is he making tabdi on you you know i'm just wondering like is this something there's a history well it must have very very strange anyway so I think that's enough for this particular video and believe me there's more but I'm just making it brief and just to conclude as well that anyone that labels me a Khariji just by labeling me a Khariji because of character assassination defamation etc from both sides from both of these uh, you know institutionalized bootleggers is that I say here and now that I condemn all forms of terrorism you know whether it be ISIS whether it be any other group whether it be any state or any individual I make that clear you know and I haven't called for any rebellions in any of the Islamic lands what I said was that the Muslims have a right to defend themselves and according to the Sharia we've got the right as well and that's how the Salaf understood it as well the early Salaf that's how they understood it so we're not calling for any rebellions but I categorically condemn all sorts of oppression and, and Islam and the Sharia gives us the right to defend ourselves depending on the level of oppression as well you know when we're talking what, what, what in essence what these institutionalized bootlickers are saying and I'm gonna have to be fr front about I'm gonna have to be straight up and, f and, and honest about it is that the Muslim ruler, according to their twisted logic, can commit Hitler-like massacres and the Muslims have to be patient with it. That's why, in essence, you're saying 
that there is no bounds for the Muslim ruler. He could do what he wants, what he wants, and how he wants. And Islam, according to them, gives them the right. So this is why I say they, in essence, have legitimized religious oppression. But of these groups are basically what we call slaves to the rulers. They have nothing but animosity against those who speak for justice, who, who tackle oppression. They uphold oppression. They do not condone oppression for the rulers, rather they give them legitimacy. And they could say, we are against it, we are against it. But then at the same time, you're saying that every single act that the ruler does, if he, opp if he oppresses, we have to be patient with it. And be warned, those who support oppression. There's a hadith in Sunan al-Nisa'i and also in Al-Tirmidhi that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, listen, that they'll be coming after me rulers and whoever enters upon them and aids them in their oppression and, and believes in their lies, then I am not from him and he is not from me and he will not join me by the lake. And then the Prophet Muhammad said, whoever does not enter upon them and does not aid them in their oppression and does not believe in their lies, then I am from him and he is from me and he will be with by the lake. Just remember that, okay? The Prophet Sallallahu says, whoever aids them in their oppression, aids them in their oppression, he is not from me and I am not from him. Okay, so to be warned, okay? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never condoned any oppression, whether it be a ruler, whether it be a, a pauper, whether it be a king, whether it be a queen, whether it be a laborer, whether it be a, a, a minister, no oppression is justified in Islam. Yes, we have patience, but that doesn't mean that we don't, uh, that doesn't mean that we just be content with it. Uh, make dua for me, follow me, subscribe on my channel, bro Haji, wa sallam ala nabiya Muhammad.